You're listening to Packers Talk Network. Packers Talk. Do you want to experience the thrill of a Packers game at Lambeau Field? If so, be sure to get your game tickets from the longtime trusted source in Wisconsin, Ticket King. Visit their locations in Milwaukee and Green Bay, or just go to their website, theticketking.com. Again, that's theticketking.com. Don't forget they have to have good reason to overturn the official's decision. Here it comes. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to After Further Review, a Packers Talk Network podcast with myself, your host, uh, Ross Uglum, I am a writer at CheeseheadTV.com, and joining me, as always, is Zach Jacobson from sunny California. Zach, how are you doing? I got no complaints from my end. How's it going over there, Ross? Good, good. Just got back from uh, Middle America, was in Omaha, Nebraska for a little conference. Uh, that's why we're recording this on a Wednesday night, but with the bye week uh, upcoming, certainly no real pressure on us to... Uh, you know, get the people what they want in any sort of timely manner. Um, speaking of the bye week, Green Bay goes into it 2-1 and one instead of 1-2, and two, thanks to a 34-27 victory over Detroit. Uh, certainly not uneventful, as the Packers at one point were actually leading that game 31-28. Uh, to 28. It wouldn't be a Packers game, though, without a significant injury to a key contributor. Tight end Jared Cook suffered a high ankle sprain. Certainly something to be... Uh, keeping an eye on, especially after what happened with uh, Ty Montgomery a season ago. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, on the positive injury front, though, it appears that all of the players that missed that game outside of Cook and Sam Shields should return. That includes uh, quarterback of the defense, Morgan Burnett, uh, edge rusher Clay Matthews, uh, elephant end Dayton Jones, and run plugger Latroy Guyon. Certainly uh, good news there, but as I mentioned, Sam Shields not among that group, is still in the concussion protocol. Adam Schefter came in with a report, expects Shields to be cleared, expects Shields to resume his football career this season, but uh, will not be able to play probably uh, until a game or two after the Packers return uh, from the bye week against the Giants. Zach, is anything specifically uh, jump out to you from the, the the news that I just shared? Oh, I think I think it's without question the, the Sam Schultz timetable because you know, if he is gone for a couple more weeks, that would mean he misses the the Week 5 primetime game on Sunday night against the visiting Giants, and they have arguably the best wide receiver trio in football right now between Odell Beckham, Victor Cruz, and the rookie Sterling Shepard, who is been playing out of his mind, you know, for a rookie wide receiver, third on the depth chart. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be it's going to be a really horrifying thing to watch, especially if Sam Shield isn't there to uh, to lead his cornerback group. This, this is this is the same secondary that has surrendered just a multitude of yards to Blake Bortles, Sam Bradford of all people, uh, Matthew Stafford, who was notorious for gashing up this Green Bay secondary, and it was. It was in full swing uh, last Sunday, so you know I'm hoping Dom Cabers, Joe Witt, you know, get get all of those guys together, make the proper adjustments, take the precautions to get ready for this Giants aerial attack because it is going to be nasty. Yeah, no question about it. I think um, you know one one positive to take away is how well Darius Gunter played. Another positive to take away, I guess, would be uh, you know how unsuccessful Detroit was throwing the ball in the, uh, I guess, competitive portion of the game. Uh, the competitive portion of the game inexplicably returned later on, but, uh, you know, the, the defense played well enough to allow the game to be 31-3 to at some point. But I, I do agree, I think Sterling Shepard as a special player uh, absolutely was smitten with him in the pre-draft process, uh, ranked him higher at wide receiver than... Uh, pretty much anyone that I saw, but really, 
you know, proving to be an exceptional player. I'm not terribly frightened of Victor Cruz anymore, but uh, Odo Beckham Jr. just, you know, that, that name speaks for itself. He is a tremendous, tremendous football player. No question about it. Sam Shields is a guy that I think the Packers are, are really going to want to have back against the Giants. Um, I'm not convinced that that's going to be a possibility as as Adam Schefter, um, you know, historically has, has been pretty pretty accurate, pretty spot on, etc. Let's talk about that uh, Detroit game. This is a midweek record, but uh, we don't have an upcoming game to really break down, so we can take a deeper dive into this one. Last week, the first thing that we talked about uh, was whether or not the run defense was for real. And there was certainly uh, reasons to question it. Um, the, the Jacksonville Jaguars were without Chris Ivory. Uh, they used second-year back T.J. Yeldon. And then, you know, Minnesota has one of the worst offensive lines in football. So the, the lack of success from a 31-year-old Adrian Peterson could have almost been expected. Now this is three games in a row. Uh, they're leading the NFL by a pretty wide margin in run defense. Uh, bringing back for me kind of, uh, I guess, memories of the J Wall with uh, Jolly and, and Jenkins. They were a pretty special run defense group there in the late uh, 2000s and, and eventually rode part of that group at least to a uh, Super Bowl championship. But I, I think now. It's pretty clear, to at least to me, that we're definitely dealing with a run defense that's legit. What do you think, Zach? There isn't a doubt in my mind. I mean, these guys are flying to the football faster than I've seen them in years. Since, you know, what you just mentioned, the aforementioned Johnny Jolly, Colin Jenkins years. I mean, my, my God, I, I, was looking, I was looking up some numbers today, and I even tweeted them out. When opposing running backs run off the right tackle of their offensive line, the Packers, the Packers front seven is, is literally right there in their face. Those running backs are averaging 2.6 yards per carry. And when those running backs decide to take between the right guard and the right tackle, the Packers are allowing three yards on eight runs. That, that, is, through, that is through the season. It's not a large sampling size, but three yards on eight touches, that's, that, that's, that's, just, that's just crazy. And we originally viewed this group as the weakest of the roster, at least I did, and I'm sure you know several others did. I mean, especially without Mike Pennell for the first four games, no Mike Pennell, and you know, a, a, a rookie, a rookie nose tackle, defensive tackle, and, and, and Kenny Clark, they have just been performing out of their minds, and it's just really taken me by surprise. No question about it. I think specifically how they're getting it done is with uh, elite edge play. I think Nick Perry, Julius Peppers have been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, defending the edge, setting the edge, and that makes life so much easier for uh, those inside guys. Kenny Clark, I think, is certainly playing well. I really think that in you know about year three of his career, he's going to be uh, a very special player. Uh, might be a ceiling for him, certainly, just on account of how defensive linemen that don't rush the passer you know, where their value really is in, in an NFL, in the NFL that we have today. But as a run defender, I mean, I really think he has a chance to be special. This goes back to, to an article I wrote last year um, talking about draft needs and, and how I had defensive line lower than most. Uh, that, of course, didn't didn't stop the Packers from drafting two, two defensive linemen. But I, I, I've talked over the years at length about um, – what positions take time? Uh, and, and I think no position really takes more time with the possible exception of wide receiver, though we're seeing some exceptions to that rule. No position takes more time to develop than a defensive lineman or, or pass rusher. Those players almost always have significant year one to year two jumps and even more significant year two to year three jumps uh, if you don't believe me, just look at the you know, statistics and impact that Mike Daniels had in year three and in year four and now in year five as one of the best players in the NFL. 
I, I don't think there's really anything hyperbolic about that. The guy has been an absolute monstrosity this year. But defensive linemen take a little bit of time to develop. And uh, guys that Thompson has had in the program for a while are now hitting those third, fourth, fifth years. Uh, Perry, Dayton, Jones, et cetera, et cetera. These guys are hitting uh, those years when it when the light kind of comes on for defensive linemen and, and edge defenders. And it, it was just sort of a, a trust the process type of deal as opposed to a, these guys don't have any talent type of deal. And, and I think that's why you're now seeing uh, that it appears Green Bay might have uh, one of the best, you know, five or six front fives in the league. The, the jury's a little bit out on the back, too, as far as uh, Jake and Blake are concerned. But even those two are, are really playing at a high level, or at least a higher level than Packers fans are used to seeing from the inside linebacker position. Absolutely. Let's flip to the other side of the ball. Zach, I want you to kind of take me through what you saw from the offense, and, and, and then I want to talk about just how bad Detroit's defense is. I haven't had a chance to look. I can't imagine that this last game helped them very much. Going into Sunday's game against the Packers, they were 27th in DVOA on defense. I, I, I would be pretty shocked uh, after they got flamed by Aaron Rodgers in the first half to see that number go up. So this is one of the worst defenses in the league, kind of unquestionably. Because the defense is so poor, does that give you a greater level of concern about whether or not the offense is actually fixed? I don't think it puts me into a state of concern as much as it does, uh, you know, a state of question. You know, I want to. I want to believe this offense is fixed, and they're finally flipping it around. Aaron Rodgers is mad, and he's 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 translating that frustration into his performance on the field. That's what I want to believe. But a Detroit Lions defense that was already as bad as it was coming in, without Ezekiel Ansah, no DeAndre Levy, they're missing a couple defensive ends. I'm not convinced. Now, what did look good, however, was. The fact that they got the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands so quick. And that's something we haven't seen in so in so long since the Packers had to adjust that in two thousand nine to help him get the ball. When he when he, when he was sacked, just just with these astronomical numbers. He was getting hit every play, he was getting brought down, you know, repeatedly in each game. The Packers had to translate that into a quick passing game. And they started doing that against Detroit. And it worked. You know, on that first drive we saw a few, we saw we saw that the touchdown, Devontae Adams, that was a slant over the middle of the field that ended up you know, turning into six. I think, uh, not necessarily convinced, but it's a good stepping stone. It's more so uh, to, you know, to get the confidence rolling with the offense again. And that was big because they their morale was just in the drain after that Minnesota game, after all the criticism through, through the week. Although, oh, is, is Aaron Rodgers, what's wrong with Aaron Rodgers? Is he broken? Have we... You know, have, have, have we praised him too much and critiqued him so little that, you know, he feels he, he has all this room for error. It, you know, it's, it was good to see the offense get rolling like that. I want to see them continue to perform week in and week out consistently like that, especially against the Giants, whose defense has been, a, you know, the complete opposite of what it was last year. Um, so it, 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 would, it would be interesting to see if they can keep that trend up. But as far as I'm convinced, I'm not exactly convinced just yet. I want to see them string that performance together for a few more games. Yeah, I think my hope comes from the schematic end of things. Uh, they did different stuff, which is important. I know that it was a bad defense, but they, they tried to do different things. And then the other the other thing that gives me hope is just how pissed off Aaron Rodgers got during the week. Um, you don't generally see him snap on reporters. He has a pretty good understanding of his own public image. And he tweaked. And... When he looked at T.J. Lang and headbutted him and said, I'm back, I think you might see uh, that level of, of Aaron Rodgers uh, for the rest of the season, getting the ball out, uh, playing more disciplined football, realizing you know that he has his weapons back, no longer needs to play Sandlot ball, and uh, you know taking his, his shots... Uh, 
his line would have looked a lot different if there wouldn't have been pass interference on that long throw to Trevor Davis, which was a throw that won. One, 74 freaking yards. One quarterback in the league is capable of making that throw. Um, potentially, you know, just from an arm strength perspective, from what I've seen in person, I think physically Carson Wentz might be capable of making that throw, but to actually have the wherewithal and the guts to do it, I think you're just talking about uh, Aaron Rodgers. Maybe physically Matthew Stafford could pull it off too, but that's not really a part of Stafford's game. That That's a once-in-a-lifetime arm talent type of deal that we saw, uh, and, and it was a, it was a huge play. I mean, if, if he catches that, it's basically no different than what actually happened. Uh, the, the Packers got all the yardage and then threw another touchdown anyway, but that's him not trying to do that on every play, just taking his shots, uh, and even taking his shots with the fastest receiver on the team, things that make sense as opposed to, you know, downfield heaves to Devontae Adams, who does his best work in the short the short passing game, the, the, the run after the catch type stuff, getting open in small areas like he did on his touchdown catch uh, the other day. But I, I think the schematic changes that were made and the fire that seems to be uh, lit under Aaron Rodgers' asses are, are the two things that have me the most optimistic about the the future there. Uh, so I, I guess I'm not convinced that the offense is fixed, but I'm more optimistic than most because I saw specific things that I needed to see. We talked about kind of the tale of two halves there. Uh, how are you more excited about the way that they were able to dial the clock back to 2014 when they used to just blow teams out in the first half at home, get up 31-3, basically make the game non-competitive, or are you more concerned that uh, they basically shut down the offense in the second half, the defense kept giving up big pass plays, and Green Bay had to run the four-minute offense to get out of there with a W? I'm definitely more concerned about the meltdown. Like I, like I just said, uh, the offense the offense played great. I'm not exactly convinced against that defense, but that that's how I feel about that start. But I'm more concerned about the meltdown because it felt so much like that that Monday night game against the Falcons from a couple of years ago. It was just a, a booming a booming first half of football. Second half, the Falcons slowly started creeping back. Green Bay escaped. You know, by a few points. That's exactly what it felt like. And McCarthy was showing shades of his former conservative self. And he says he's not a conservative football coach, which I completely didn't buy for a second because he's still Mike McCarthy. And it showed he it showed he still has remnants of that same mentality, that same you know demeanor late in games, just taking the foot off the gas. Don't take your foot off the gas. Push, shove your foot into your opponent's throat. And don't stop until that clock has you know has nothing but zeros across it. So I, I, I'm definitely more concerned about the way that game finished because I don't want to see that happen to the Packers this season. I don't want to see another heartbreaking playoff loss like we saw in Seattle in January 2015. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see any shades of conservatism from from McCarthy. I'm just I'm, I'm past that. I want to see. I want that. I want that Mike Daniels attitude, where you just you're, you're the bully in the, in, the, in, the, in the sandbox. You know, you know what I mean. I just want to see them finish a football game. Yeah, Don't give I the understand. opponent any, any chance of coming back. I understand where you're coming from. Certainly, uh, the one thing I'll say, I guess, is well that I disagree only because uh, the only way that I think about this team ever is just in terms of the ability to win or not win a world championship. Um, like Mike McCarthy said, we don't hang division title banners around here. And I, what I saw from the offense and what basically got me back believing that this team could win a Super Bowl, uh, that they are capable of doing so, uh, because I do believe that when Sam Shields returns, that the, the, the secondary, when Sam Shields and Morgan Burnett return, the secondary is going to be slotted correctly. Uh, they're going to be able to 
run kind of the way that they are more accustomed to. I think Quentin Rollins is going to certainly become a better player. Uh, Kentrell Bryce and Josh Hawkins are both tremendously talented players that are going to be much better football players in January than they are right now. It's just a fact. Joe Witt is the best cornerbacks coach in the NFL. Uh, Nothing hyperbolic about that either. He's going to have those kids ready to play. I don't have the same level of path concern with the pass defense that you do. I do, you know, worry about the conservative tendencies certainly. But the question is not are you worried. It's what what did do you care about more? And I care about the fact that this offense finally looked capable of winning a Super Bowl again. And I think after three weeks, we know that the defense is championship caliber. Um, Still tough to win Super Bowls, obviously. That, that, that's not a, a shock to anybody or any, any kind of hard-hitting analysis. But at least now after this game, I think it's possible. I completely agree. And, you know, I, I'm i on the same page as you about the defense. As far as the secondary goes, not so much. But the front seven, definitely, that's, that's, that's a Super Bowl caliber front seven. And it's crazy because it's just, it's just plastered with these young guys. And, you know, just to think that's the Super Bowl caliber defensive line, it's just crazy to think of. But I do believe when Sam Schultz comes back and Morgan Merrick gets back on the field, from his back injury, Schultz is completely cleared. I think, I do think, I agree with you, they will be back to what they were doing before. And at full strength as well. They'll, they won't have the, the off-season rust like they did against Jacksonville. Hopefully that's shaking off. They'll be, they'll be ready to go. Speaking of the secondary, are you specifically concerned about Demarius Randall? Uh, was victimized by Stephon Diggs in Week Two. Um, I, I think if he just plays an average game, if the Packers get average games from Aaron Rodgers and Sam Shields, they probably beat Minnesota by ten. Uh, both players turned in, you know, D level work that that night. They they, they were both. Um, Pretty darn bad. But Sam Shields struggled, or excuse me, Demarius Randall without Sam Shields struggled a little bit again on Sunday, though he did make a Demarius Randall play. I mean, that him taking the ball away from Eric Ebron is the type of playmaking that they fell in love with when he was at Arizona State. Um, the kid is just a ball magnet and, and continues to be. I wish that they could get him some safety help so that he wouldn't have to, you know, be so concerned about about getting deep and could just make plays. But are you worried about Demarius Randall for the rest of the season or or even just, uh, you know, what I've been talking about, him potentially being a star? I mean, are, do any of these things make you worry about him long term or is this just stuff that can get worked out schematically or by improving his technique? I'm not, I'm not worried at all. Like you said earlier, Joe Witt, he is the best cornerbacks coach in football. I, I, I think we also got to remember, you know, Demarius Randall, he's a second-year player still. He's still going through some growing pains. And he's part of a young secondary. I think he'll be he'll be able to get it right. Joe Witt will coach him up a little bit. He'll, he'll get it right. With Sam Shields back in the field especially, there won't be much reliance on Randall to be that, that guy that shadows the opposing team's number one receiver. He could possibly come into the slot, keep Rollins on the outside as well. Quentin Rollins and his performance that I am about Randall's, to be honest. Yeah, we could certainly get to a point where Rollins moves to dime. I mean, I think uh, it could be like Shields in 2010, and Gunter is just going to come in and play nickel and play the outside, give him the safety help. Shields plays the other side. And then uh, Randall's the playmaker in the slot. Well, Quentin Rollins doesn't have you know, really any kind of claim to significant playing time. If he continues to struggle the way that he has, I, I think you could see him uh, see a dip in playing time. But he's another guy that I'm not concerned with long term. I think he's definitely a part of the future in Green Bay and is still a very, very talented player. Uh, I, I do disagree with the, the folks that you know ever suggested that Rollins was the better player of the two. I think Randall certainly has more upside. I think he, he has a chance to be a star. Uh, that I think Randall or Rollins, excuse me, could be a good player. 
not convinced he has star potential uh, the way that Demarius Randall does. Which of the four guys that I mentioned that will return, uh, not necessarily about Shields, because I think we've kind of talked that to death, which of the guys that I mentioned that returned do you feel like was the most missed on Sunday? And just so we can kind of remind everybody, I'm talking about Dayton Jones, Detroit guy on Morgan Burnett, and, uh, of course, the claymaker, Clay Matthews. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swing in the direction of uh, Burnett. Because Clay Matthews, we know how great he is. We know how, how versatile Dayton Jones is and his shift to the hybrid role or the elephant role, as Mike McCarthy would like to say, the Troy guy on with the MCL sprain, you know, they, they suffice just fine on Sunday without those three guys. Not to say moving forward, you know, they're not, they're going to be completely disposable. We're not going to need it, you know, those, those three, but I think on Sunday, as far as that goes, definitely Margaret Burnett was the most missed. I do like, I do like Micah Hyde, his ability to fill in in that role, you know, if, if Micah Hyde was to come down as the, as the hybrid linebacker, which is the you know the new the new position they've been experimenting with him with, uh, I, th- I think Micah Hyde could potentially perform well in his plays as can Kentrell Price, although he did blow a certain coverage assignment on that Marvin Jones touchdown at the end of the uh, the first half. It was he, he was supposed to be that safety help on that play, just tossing that out there and Hawk, Hawkins slipped while he was guarding Jones. But um, Burnett was definitely the most missed. He's you know, he's been with that team since 2010. He's been one of the playmakers in that defense who has quietly performed well. And, you know, he doesn't get he doesn't get really talked about so much, you know, along with the other the elite safeties in football right now. But, you know, Burnett's been really beyond serviceable. And, you know, his presence was definitely missed on Sunday. Well, yeah, and what, the other thing with him, too, is when the Packers have been good on the back end, he's always been the second safety. Um uh, they struggled, frankly, when Burnett had to be the number one guy, uh, whether it was M.D. Jennings, whether it was Deron McMillan. Um, they were not a great defense when he was the top safety. They were a great defense when he played with Nick Collins. They had the potential to be a great defense now that he is with Aha Clinton Dix. But you're right, though, in the sense that he gets everybody lined up, and though he is not certainly the the quality of player, and that's, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but he's not the quality of player that Clay Matthews is. Clay Matthews, when healthy, is an all-pro level guy. Uh, the, the Packers are so deep and talented at that edge position that when Matthews is gone, they don't miss him as much as they used to. And right now, Kentrell Bryce, while you and I think he is physically very special, and in 2018 might be a hell of a safety. Uh, right now, he's not completely assignment sure, and that's where I think the Packers certainly missed Morgan Burnett in that second half on Sunday. I mean, I think their defense misses a lot of teeth when it's up by that many points, but at the same time, uh, Burnett's a, a guy that I think really is important to the, what uh, Capers asked that defense to do because – Dom's really, you know, his scheme really is still complicated. There, there are a lot of things going on in Dom's scheme, regardless of how old it is. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that Morgan Burnett, definitely the most missed injured player on Sunday afternoon. I want to talk briefly about Trevor Davis, uh, a kid that actually out-snapped both Jared Aber- well, all three – he outsnapped Jared Abadaris, Jeff Janis. Now, Jeff has a club on his hand, uh, but he also got more snaps than Ty Montgomery. What is it that you think Green Bay sees in Davis that has potentially allowed him to jump to fourth on the receiver depth chart? I think it's exactly what you mentioned earlier, his speed. And that that aspect of his game kind of really stands out. He was just a crazy kick returner in college, you know, at Hawaii and you know, Cal, he was, just, he was, he stood out. And the Packers may have drafted him originally to be a kick returner on their team, but if he could be something special in the offense and bring an element of speed to a group of receivers who were ranked as the slowest with James Jones, uh, that were ranked as the slowest in 2015, you know, that's huge. 
And we saw what he could do with that speed when Rodgers threw that, that, that 70 yard bomb into the end zone, 70 plus yard bomb in the end zone, and it was a, it was a penalty. Um, you know, he got ahead of the defender, he just tripped on the end of his route. We saw him on that comeback where he dropped that, that easy ball, hit him right in the chest, which I believe didn't count as a drop, so the package receivers are safe right now, still without a drop all season long. Uh, you know, he really he brings that aspect to the Packers' offense, and they could really use that. And I know I know Mike McCarthy has been wanting to get both him and Tom Montgomery more involved, you know, starting Sunday, and we'll see moving forward if they stick with that. I agree. I think Davis was underutilizing Cal's system. Uh, we're finding out now that it's possible that Jared Goff wasn't that good. <laughs> you, you get a lot yeah, of guys. It could could be. <laughs> well, you I mean, just in the sense that you know you get a lot of guys that get a bad rap at receiver because their quarterback was good. And it even works the other way around, I think. Uh, we're finding out that Laquan Treadwell maybe wasn't so good and that Chad Kelly is a hell of a prospect. Uh, those relationship receiver to um, quarterback, it is hard to define which one is which. I think you get a lot of... A lot of times, you know, receivers this way or that are being credited or discredited because of quarterback play. I just think that Davis was potentially underutilized at Cal. Uh, I don't think that the way that they rotated those guys in and out, he w- was given the targets that potentially his talent level required. I think that's probably why it, it, it appears as though he's a third-round talent that guys were uh, potentially talking about, you know, as a as UDFA, a guy that people were even giving Ted a hard time about uh, drafting him, you know, in the fifth round, thought it was potentially a reach. Now doesn't look like such a reach, uh, possibly because of what Sonny Dykes was doing with him there at Cal, uh, and, and potentially his... <coughs> Quarterback not being as good as we thought as well, but I was impressed. Uh, the drop, you know, that's something that is just a, a physical error. Those can be corrected. I think part of it, too, is, you know, really his first, he got interfered with on the bomb. That drop was the, a, kind of a chance at his first NFL catch, and I think he freaked out a little bit because he was that's so That's what I was thinking. Because yeah. he was so wide open. Um that stuff goes away. Uh, I think few people forget how much Jordy Nelson dropped the ball when he was younger. Uh, I, I don't think people forget how much James Jones dropped the ball when he was younger. But young receivers drop footballs. That's part of of life, I guess. That's part of developing young players. They make uh, you know mental errors that don't necessarily always have to do with their physical capabilities, whether you're talking about hand-eye coordination or whatever. I, I think that the fact that Davis was that open both times uh, should have had a big first down and, and then certainly should have had a long touchdown if not being interfered with. Speaks brightly for his future right now and his future two, three years down the road, no question about it. The other player I want to talk about is Christian Ringo, a guy that uh, was not on the active roster last year, but was part of last year's draft class. Uh, for all intents and purposes, is a rookie. One of the guys that was really part of the level of concern, him being an unknown quantity, was uh, worrisome for people, and there were a lot of them, that thought this defensive line might be a problem, especially... Uh, until Mike Pennell came back. This is a guy that I think has really answered the bell. He's the shorter pass rusher type in the mold of a Mike Daniels. Certainly not that level of player yet, but I've been really specifically impressed with his work in the run game. I think that despite being somewhat undersized, he has come in and provided the Packers with very, very valuable snaps. And I think honestly, has earned himself a chance to be a part of everything, whether or not uh, Mike Pennell is, is back and in, in part of the of the defense. What have you seen, I guess, from, from Ringo in your limited amount of time, understandably, to be able to kind of 
uh, scout him and what he's been able to bring to the 2016 Packers. Yeah, that's definitely a... Individually, I haven't seen much of Ringo, but that's not to say he hasn't done much. I mean, he played 24 snaps on Sunday against Detroit, uh, not very much in the two games before that, but I haven't seen very much individually of Ringo, so I'm going to hold off on an opinion from that and try to not try to pretend I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, you know, Ringo, I, I, know he's, I know he's a very gifted player. You know, he played well in the preseason. I wanna, uh, I'm going to check him out going forward for sure. All right, no problem. Let's talk then about actual rookies. Uh, the Packers used a large number of first and second year players, but even just specifically the first year guys, who are you most impressed with? Uh, Kyler Fackrell gave the Packers a number of snaps. Kenny Clark obviously is the only healthy nose tackle on the roster. Um, Blake Martinez gave them a bunch of snaps. Kentrell Bryce had to play. They had rookies all over on defense, uh, drafted or not. Yeah, absolutely. And they have been impressing just so, just, just mightily. And Blake Martinez especially, he's the one that stands out the most to me. You know, you can argue Kenny Clark's a close second, but, God, Blake Martinez, and that, that gash he had busted open on his nose, I mean, I wasn't going to go you know, without talking about that, because that just... That's screaming Ray Nitsky to me. I'm sorry. I don't want. I'm not drawing comparisons between the two, but that just that 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 said, good old fashioned 1960s Green Bay Packers football, and that he got back in the game. The stitches busted open. All all of the, all that stuff. And aside from his grit, though, you know he's been great. He he specialized in 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 pass coverage. You know in college, and he's bringing that aspect to the Packers, and that's huge because that is. That is a part of the Packers' defense, their linebacking course, where they have lacked. And that's what Jake, Jake Ryan, last year, he tried to, you know, base his game around, really learn the whole concept of, of pass coverage as a linebacker. And, you know, I, I'm loving the whole, tan, the whole tandem they have in there. Joe, Joe Thomas, Jake Ryan, Blake Martinez, and, you know, two second-year guys and one rookie. That's just... That, that, that entire defense is just based around youth, and I love it. I love how well they perform. Yeah, the uh, linebackers sure took it upon themselves to aesthetically endear themselves to the Packer faithful. Boy, does Jake Ryan look cool with a tinted visor. And then uh, Blake Martinez, obviously, yeah. with the... Uh, you know the the bloody nose and, and bleeding from the face and pl- playing middle linebacker. Nothing's going to endear you to the upper Midwest any faster than uh, you know playing football with a with a bloody nose and, and blood on your jersey. And, and uh, it, it certainly is overrated. I mean, I don't think there's any question about that. But something to be said for toughness, and that's uh, what. What Martinez certainly showed on Sunday, and it's going to endear him to the fan base. There's no no possible question about that. I just want to briefly, though, talk about um, Kyler Fackrell. I think that's a guy that you needed to get quick returns on investment there, and it's it's a reality at this point. He is a 25 year old rookie. Um, I think he's like barely younger than Randall Cobb, which is insane considering that Randall is, like, into his extension. At this point, he's not even on his rookie deal anymore. But Fackrell's an older rookie and and needed to be uh, a little bit NFL-ready being a third-round pick, and it certainly appears that he is. Uh, I haven't had a chance to see him much in coverage, and that was actually kind of, I think, why they drafted him, because at this point, I think that Fackrell is pretty clearly their most talented coverage outside linebacker. But they've had him rushing the passer, and he's been doing a pretty good job. Uh, his first career sack, I'm actually going to put that on Taylor Decker. That was an absolutely disgusting pass-blocking rep from the Lions' first-round pick. But when other players... Yeah, I don't, know, made, I don't know what the hell that was. Yeah, it was brutal. I mean, I, I had a chance to watch that on the All-22, and I don't really understand. I mean, I think he slipped, to be God's honest with you. Uh, otherwise, technically, that was a pretty... Pretty disgusting pass blocking rep. Uh, at any rate, Fackrell is a player that is making plays, carving himself out a little time on this 
on this defense. It certainly gives the Packers versatility then to use him as a coverage linebacker and potentially you know bring Clay on some of those uh, inside blitzes as Capers really enjoys, I think, getting Clay Matthews one-on-one with guards. He is too athletic of a player and too strong, usually, to be effectively pass-blocked by guards. Fackerel, a guy that can be uh, used in zone blitzes to drop into coverage, and I'm excited to see that part of his game because it appears certainly that his run defense and his pass rush are NFL quality, and they were the two question marks of his coming out of Utah State, so very exciting for me. And the last thing I want to talk about in the Detroit game here is the play of Lane Taylor, and we can kind of expand upon that and talk about all three games. Uh, this is a guy who barely, you know, is, is, is making almost nothing and has replaced Josh Sitton, and I think really done so admirably, is on a very team-friendly contract for the next few years here. How impressed have you been with Lane Taylor, uh, and how excited are you about his future, or, or do you think that he's a guy that maybe is playing on some borrowed time, considering that the Packers are at some point this season going to get Corey Lindsley back? I think if he can suffice at left guard, I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon. If it's not broken, don't fix it. You know, he's he has performed so well in the shoes of Josh Sitton, and those are some pretty big. Sh- Pretty big shoes to fill, so you know all 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 do all due respect to Sitton and you know what he did in Green Bay, but Taylor, without a doubt, he has. I mean, he hasn't done anything eye opening, but he he's been serviceable, and that's all you can ask for a guy in such short notice to come in and fill the shoes of Josh Sitton. That's you know it's really really commendable on his end, and you know he he, he he's done his job, and he's done it to the best of his ability, and that's really all you can expect out of uh, out of Lane Taylor. He's so quick. Yeah, I, I agree. I think to expect him to play at some sort of all-pro level uh, is unrealistic, but to expect him to really not be a liability on an offensive line that feels pretty darn good about the other four spots is important, and that's what I think that he's been able to do. Uh, as, you know, the Packers have played, with the exception of you know missing Ansa, they've played against some pretty high-profile pass-rushing teams. The Jaguars, uh, you know, have Malik Jackson from Denver, uh, have Dante Fowler. They have the blitzing Jalen Ramsey. The Vikings have Everson Griffin, uh, you know, big-time guys. But even Linval Joseph is one of the best defensive interior players in all of football. And the offensive line has not gotten Rodgers killed, which is important, especially considering kind of how long he takes sometimes to get stuff going. So that's, that's an important thing, uh, certainly something to watch going forward. But I think when you consider the cost savings, uh, the money that went towards David Bakhtari's extension, there are other guys that need to get paid. And whether you like it or not, Josh Sitton's money uh, is going to be a part of that going forward. He was not part of the long-term plan, and it appears that it's not having a huge effect on the 2014 team uh, that he is not here. So I think that that's important and that Lane Taylor should certainly be uh, commended. Let's do our deep dive, though. Let's do our actual film review. Uh, What did you see from Aaron Rodgers this week on film that made you believe he could be uh, the player that he was moving forward this season? It was everything I mentioned earlier. The the, the quick passes, the, 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 the urge to get the ball out. Quicker, and he didn't miss really. He didn't miss targets this week. You know, in Minnesota, we saw him miss some of the underneath stuff to Randall Cobb. But this week, he was kind of looking for those guys. He didn't need. He didn't have much of a necessity to extend plays like he. You know, he's really relied on the past year. Uh, there was one play where he took a. You know, there was a rush in his face, which probably explains why he didn't see Randall Cobb coming across the middle. Who he was wide open would have been a sure touchdown. But he tossed it up for Jordan Nelson in the left corner of the end zone, overthrew it. Uh, but you know, a lot of a lot of three step drops, get the ball out, you kind of progress downfield instead of looking for the deep shot. We saw a lot more of that, a lot more poise for Aaron Rodgers than we've seen. He just looked he looked like the Aaron Rodgers of two thousand fourteen. He looked just completely comfortable in the pocket. He trusted his blocking. It looked like he had trust 
restored in his receivers again. It was just, it, it was a beautiful connection that the whole first half, every time the Packers got the ball, you you, you knew they would score. You knew they were going to have to march down the field systematically and just put up points, and that's exactly what they did. So, you know, as far as Aaron Rodgers goes, he got the ball out a lot faster, and I'm hoping we can see a lot more of that moving forward because the Packers may have just solved their Yeah, I think, you know... You know what their offense? I, I think... more that integrated in the offense, that'll open up the deep pass again. That'll be able to bring up the safeties a little more, cause them to play up up in the box a little more. That's going to open a deep shot eventually. The same thing how they got the running game going. You know, that's, that's definitely going to help the passing game as well. Right, and I think, you know, one of the things that I saw was, fundamentally, he was much stronger... Uh, not so many of the back foot throws certainly has the arm talent to do stuff like that. But when it didn't call for him to sling the ball in their sidearm, when it didn't call for him to fire off his back foot, uh, when, when the play called for him to have normal, uh, quarterback mechanics, I really felt like he performed a lot better than I've seen him perform in quite some time. I think that the trust in his receivers was restored. I, I think one of the big problems after Nelson went down, in 2015 he got into a mode where he truly believed that, that his receivers could not get open on the primary break, that the, the plays that were being called, uh, whether he liked them or not, were not plays that could be executed against press coverage, and that's what teams decided to play uh, against the Packers. They took away Eddie Lacy, they took away the quick passing game, and Rodgers started to be convinced that the only way to move the ball successfully was going to be second and third breaks after plays break down. So he was breaking plays down, uh, not necessarily the defense. He was making these plays last longer so that um, his guys who were not fundamentally getting open would be able to compete. And now I think he's got a trust in, in either Nelson again, a trust in Cobb, or in the scheme, or potentially in these new receivers. But I, I see the ball, as you said, coming out on time, but I also see him uh, just playing quarterback instead of trying to uh, you know, play playground football. And I certainly appreciate that and, and, and see that as a, a potentially a very big deal for the postseason aspirations of this team. That, uh... That brings me to our, to our really our, our next topic. Uh, I posted a question to Cheesehead CB this morning. My 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 daily Packers question of the day. You know that uh, is Mike Daniels elite? Really, it, it, you know it was something that I was wondering after his dominating performance against the Lions. You know he's week in and week out. He's really been performing at a high level. That kind of makes you go whoa. You know he did it last year as well. 2014, he was kind of coming onto the scene a little more. I, I, I even got called out on Twitter by him. He called me crazy because I, you know, I, after the 2014 season, over the offseason, they said I wanted to see more of Mike Daniels. I wanted to see him kind of kind of earn his status a little more. And he went on Twitter and he called me crazy. And he he went and proved me, he proved me wrong. So, you know, I, I, want, I want to know from the Cheese and TV readers, and I'd like to know your opinion as well. Is Mike Daniels elite? Is he considered amongst the top, you know, defensive linemen in the NFL right now? Well, the question that you asked, and, and I'd just like to, you know, give all due respect to a PFT commenter. Any anytime the the question of a player being elite or not elite comes up, uh, those respects have to be have to be given, uh, but it, it is an interesting topic, whether you're talking about, um, you, you know, Joe Flacco or Mike Daniels. I, I think you, you you phrased it perfectly there. Is he considered? No, I, I really don't think. Uh, first of all, it's hard. Uh, interior defensive linemen in a 3-4 don't get a ton of pub, number one. But number two, I don't think that he specifically is getting the pub that he deserves. Now, is he actually elite from a 3-4 defensive end perspective? Yeah, I think uh, with the loss of J.J. Watt for this extended period of time, 
you're looking at one of the best two or three, uh, three, four defensive ends in the league. Uh, a guy that plays a lot of defensive tackle in four-man fronts when Green Bay goes uh, nickel. And this is a, a guy that really, yes, is absolutely elite, uh, is now a dominant force in the NFL, a guy that is consistently being game plan to be single teamed and those uh, game plans are being altered mid game. You saw it happen against Detroit. You certainly saw it happen against Minnesota. They double teamed him on every play in the second half and it limited, I think what uh, Green Bay was able to do defensively against Minnesota in that second half. Uh, I, th- I think that the Daniels absolutely is an elite player despite uh pretty much being built the exact opposite of what you would want a normal 5-tech to look like in a 3-4. He is an outstanding football player. So let's uh, wrap up the show here by talking a little bit of bye week football. Um, Green Bay has a week 4 bye. It's the earliest bye they're off. I know Philadelphia, I just happen to know that Philadelphia is also off um, because I, I happen to know that Carson Wentz and his Eagles teammates are coming back to Fargo for homecoming. That's the only reason I even know that. But the uh, yeah. the um, Packers have a very early bye week. Uh, they obviously can use it because of the injured status of the team. At the same time, though, it means there's a long haul ahead. Is this bye week a little bit too early, or do you feel like it's come just in time? I think it has its perks and its downsides. You know, the, the, the good sides being, yes, they needed they needed the rest. They needed to get their, their, their injured players back. They needed to, you know, kind of rehabilitate a little bit. And another perk to it is they need to make adjustments because they had a brutal first three games, you know, defensively, not, not the front seven. Uh, we can't praise those guys enough, but... It gives them the chance to make adjustments for the for the, the, the tough road ahead. And the downsides, yeah, it's it's a little early because now the Packers have thirteen straight thirteen straight games, I believe, afterwards. If I did my math right, I'm not completely sure. Yeah, off the top, but I believe thirteen straight games. So thirteen straight games, that's going to take its toll eventually, and fatigue is going to set in, and it's going to be a big test on this on this this football team whether or not they could sustain themselves over that stretch of games and. It's just it, it, it's going to be tough. I don't disagree. I think you're right. I mean, it, it puts it certainly. I believe puts kind of the onus on them. I really think that they need to go, uh, you know, eleven and two probably over the next thirteen games. I, I think that they have to find a way to go thirteen and three past Minnesota and get that that week of rest, I think that it's going to be so important for them to use that mini buy um, after the Thursday night game against Chicago because that's going to be the last rest that they have unless they can find a way to get a top two seed in the NFC. I think they're certainly talented enough to do that, um, but Minnesota has to lose a few games here. I think they will. I mean, I think that offense is probably one of the worst five or six offenses in the league. Um their, their defense might be one of the best two or three defenses in the league, but eventually that offense is going to uh, cost them a football game. I think it's potentially safe to say also that eventually Sam Bradford is going to be unavailable for them. I, mean, I don't think he's ever played a 16-game season and stayed healthy the entire time. Uh, but I, I really think that the Packers are put more pressure on themselves now with this early bye to win 12 or 13 games and be one of the top two seeds in the NFC because they need that bye week at the end of the season uh, more than likely, especially with the injury luck that this team has had. Let's just talk about, um, you know, briefly what they need to get cleaned up during the bye week and which player you're most excited to get back after the bye. It goes without saying, the, the secondary. You know, we've mentioned it. Time and time again, for the duration of this podcast, they have a very bad secondary right now that is getting gashed week by week. So, based off of that, I think the, most, the player I'm most excited to get back, not necessarily after this bye week, but in the coming weeks, definitely Sam Shields. Because he will help kind of round out those the cornerbacks unit. As far as right after the bye week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll with uh, Morgan Burnett. 
same choices earlier. Uh, we, we know his role in the Packers defense. You know, we know they can go along for now without Clay Matthews, Anton Jones, and those guys right there in the middle. But definitely, definitely Morgan Burnett. That's my choice. Uh, you know, they got to get that secondary cleaned up and that 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 pass defense as well. I mean, they they've just been getting gashed deep down the field. I believe deep down the right sideline, they've given up over 300 yards on nine completions this season through the first three games. Nine completions for 300 yards, that's just that's just terrible. And that's just one portion of the field, you know. So, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully they can get that cleaned up, especially with the Giants coming up, and they don't exactly have an easy schedule ahead, contrary to popular belief. I mean, they'll, they'll be facing Julio Jones in a few weeks. They, they have a... You know, Des Bryant, bar, barring if he's healthy or not, they have him in a couple weeks. It's just, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be a tough stretch. Hopefully, they can get things worked out. I think I agree. Uh, I think you know, my guy is probably Clay Matthews, just because of how good of a player I think he is. Uh, I know how important Morgan Burnett is, but in the long haul, they're gonna need Matthews. He, he's the superstar of the defense. He needs to get right. He needs to get healthy. He's a guy I think that you can see a pretty significant drop-off in his play when he's at 90%. Uh, the Packers need him operating at 100%. He is uh, kind of just a guy when he's playing hurt, but he's a field tilter when he's not, and they need him to be a field tilter. I think that his ability yeah. to rush the passer, I think they can honestly become an overwhelming pass rush, and then they do get – uh, they do afford the defensive backs the opportunity to gamble because uh, the pass clock is, is sped up so much. As far as what they need to get cleaned up during the bye week, I just think that they need to get uh, some offensive stuff cleaned up and then in, in the defensive secondary get that cleaned up. Um, I'd like them to try out punters. I don't think that's going to happen. But that, that is another area that I guess concerns me a little bit. Uh, with that, though, we're going to wrap up the show here. I'd like to thank you guys, as always, for listening. Uh, Zach and I certainly appreciate you can subscribe to the Packers Top Network on iTunes, Stitcher, any other aggregator that you might uh, know of for podcasts. But certainly if you get a chance, give us a, <clears throat> a, a review. We like the ones with five stars. Leave a comment. Uh, those types of things optimize us as far as search engines are concerned, uh, especially the ones that are built into those podcast aggregators. It's going to allow us to uh, reach more Packers fans, and that's really what we are trying to do. You can follow me on Twitter. I am at Ross Uglum. You can follow Zach. Where can I follow you? Zach A. Jacobson, same as uh, last week, same as the week before. You guys know where to find us. Certainly, and we will uh, continue our work. Uh, I'm on PackersTalk.com and Cheesehead TV. You can catch uh, Zach on Cheesehead TV. Thanks, everyone, one last time, and go Pack Go!